take it away. My name is Brooke Marston. This is Jane Darbyshire. We're both members of the Cartography and Geovisualization Group here at Oregon State. We're part of the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. And it's our pleasure today to talk to you about creating an interactive atlas uh, for ebooks, or for iBooks, specifically for the iPad. Um, the idea of creating an interactive atlas for the iPad was really pioneered here at Oregon State by uh, Dr. Yenny. He's the head of the Cartography and Geovisualization Group. He's a professor in, the, in CEOs. And he teaches a course in the winter term called Computer Assisted Cartography. And the course is structured around having the students build an interactive atlas for the iPad. So the first time he taught this course was in 2013. And the students developed this atlas, the Atlas of the Columbia River Basin, which was really well received within the cartographic community. It's something that not a lot of people have done and not a lot of people have seen before. Um, so since it was so well received, he taught again in the winter term this year, in 2014 and the students developed the Atlas of Infectious Diseases. And this has won a couple of awards recently. Um, in 2014, just recently, it won the British Cartographic Society and National Geographic Society's new map maker award. And just two weeks ago, it won the NASA's uh, Student Dynamic Map Competitions Award for the best narrative map. So it has also been really well received. So you might be asking, why are we focusing on creating atlases for tablets? Well, we're noticing that a lot of consumers are shifting away from PCs, from desktop computers, towards tablets and smartphones. And not only because it's portable, it's more convenient, also because it is more intuitive for a larger age range of users, and they tend to be less expensive than desktop computers. Um, by the end of 2015, it's estimated that more tablets are going to be sold than desktop, desktop computers and laptops combined. Um, so we have to really start asking ourselves, how can we in academia utilize this technology in order to best disseminate or distribute our research and our ideas. And it's also important to note that uh, tablets are used for consuming content, not necessarily creating it. The atlas that we created, we created with an actual desktop computer, but we made it specifically for use on an iPad. There are currently three options for creating a tablet atlas. The first is to develop an app. An app is a standalone software application that users can download. Um, it accesses kind of the hardware features of your device. Uh, it can also use the operating system functionality of your device. So it gives the authors more design uh, creativity. Um, the app can actually serve as an interface towards a, a cartographic database that's updated regularly so you can get more real-time data that way. The problem is, um, or really more the disadvantage, is that you have to have um, a specialized skill set when it comes to creating an app. So you need to be able to understand programming languages or hire someone that can do that for you. So it doesn't really appeal to a large range of users at the moment. Another option is creating an HTML website that's rendered by a browser. Um, this is more accessible to, to more users because more people can write HTML than they can a specific programming language. Um, the downside of this is that as the author, you need to understand if you're creating an atlas, the principles associated with creating a map specifically for the web because it is different than cre creating a traditional like paper map. And then the last option currently available for creating an atlas is the interactive ebook, and you use an authoring software such as iBooks Author, or very recently Adobe InDesign has produced um, an authoring software. So this is the option that we opted for. It's really it's easily available. It's easy to understand, um, and so a lot of users can actually learn this program. It's more intuitive than a lot of the programming aspects of creating apps. So the atlas is kind of just generally about them. Um, I've kind of already gone over this, but they're created in a class called Computer Assisted Cartography that's taught, to, taught by Dr. Bernhard Yeni in the winter term. It's a class with about 15 to 20 students, um, usually a mix of undergraduate and graduate students. It's an upper, upper division class, a split level. Uh, it's kind of challenging trying to get 20 people to agree on one topic for an atlas. And also because we only have 10 weeks in a term, that's as much time as we have to create an actual um, cohesive, substantial atlas with good, accurate content in it. So in the first week, we have students propose topics that they're interested in for seeing as an atlas. Um, also, what's difficult about that is it needs to be a topic that's not too broad so that um, it's, it seems like a cohesive atlas, but also not so narrow that each person is still able to find something within that topic that interests them. So they have their own niche that they can fit in and pick out some activity that interests them and map that. 
So we, it's, very, it's done very democratically. Each person <coughs> submits ideas, and then class as a whole votes on them until we come to a majority for one topic, and that's the topic that we choose. Um, and then throughout the term, we have the students create about two or three pages each for the atlas, and they propose ideas throughout that term, and the TA and the professor can feedback on it. Um, and then once we have the pages, we can identify kind of common themes, and then those are what um, creates the chapters in the atlas. So the first step for making our map is actually to create the page template, and this is done in iBooks Author. Uh, the reason this is so important is because this is what gives the atlas the, its, its look and what makes it kind of a comprehensive and cohesive atlas. So each person creates their own maps, but if they put them all in the same template, it looks more like it's, one, it's done by one person rather than by 20 individuals. So the, the template is kind of like the colors you use, the fonts you use, the sizes, um, all those kind of, the margins you use, just the formatting of it. That's what creates our template. Then the students, they come up with their topics for their pages, um, go out and get their own data, and create the map in like ArcGIS or, or QGIS um, geoprocessing software and Illustrator. And then they save it as a PDF, and the PDF of the map is what's brought into iBooks Author. And then from there, they add the text and whatever figures or diagrams they have to go along with their map on that page. So some of the Additional options that students have are integrating um, SVG or HTML maps. Those are custom uh, animations. So iBooks Author has its own uh, built-in animations. Uh, they're called widgets. It's its own interactivity, and they're pretty easy and simple to, to add. But if someone wants to do something a little more customized, and they have this, the, t the skills and the tools to do it, they can create their own custom animation. You can also embed a keynote presentation and um, if you're not familiar with what a keynote presentation is, it's basically the, the Mac version of PowerPoint so that you can have a slideshow on your page in your iBooks author. And then you can also um, incorporate 3D objects, which is something we haven't really explored a whole lot yet, but we would like to get into that. So now I'm going to hand it over to Jane, and she's going to kind of go over some of the things that you can actually do in, in iBooks author. So I'm Jane, and I've got a couple of short videos for you. And so what these are, are basically just um, looking at the computer screen while we're making these. We did some demos. And uh, just to show you of what, um, how kind of simple this really is to do. Uh, the first thing with this, though, is they've just released a new version of iBooks out there. So what you're seeing on this screen might look a little bit different, or you may have some new options in the new one. We haven't had any chance to check that out. It just came out, I think, at the end of last week. So we haven't had much time to play around with that. So here we're opening iBooks Author in the bottom toolbar there. And you can see all these different templates are available to you. You've got portrait and landscape templates, so you can decide how you want your user to hold the device. Um, you'll notice, however, there is no blank template. So what we did was modified one of the existing templates, which is just this upper left one here. And you can actually treat that as a blank template in a sense. You can alter the layout. You can change the fonts, how the page looks. You can add whatever styles that you want. Um, you can also style your chapters in here, um, how you want your sections to be divided, and then what your pages within each chapter should look like. That's all stuff that you can do in the templates. And we strongly recommend that you do this at the very beginning. I was part of the work on the first atlas that we did, and we did not set up a template in advance. And then we had to go back, and we had all these PDFs with text. And you had to take the text remove it from the PDFs, and then put it in, in these templates, and it was kind of this backwards process. And luckily at the time we had an intern that was hired as part of our lab to help with this process, but um, for the second atlas we didn't, so it was really important that we got a template in place before doing anything else. So the next one, so here um, I'm going to show you how to insert a photo and turn it into a kind of a widget like what Brooke was talking about. So this will go up here, and you see this widget menu up top. And we've gone into edit and we've just pasted in this image right in here. So first you just paste in an image from wherever, you know, in this case we made this in Illustrator, I think. And then we've gone into the widgets and we're opening this menu here. And we're going to make it so that the user can maximize this image on click. And what that means is they'll be able, it'll take over the whole screen of their device. So instead of just looking at this little map here, they can actually touch the image and it will become the size of the full screen. So this is a demo on the actual iPad that we filmed. So you'll see like a little white hand with a circle around it. That's the user's click. It'll show the title of the image down here. And up top, you can see all of the detail now in the work that you did, instead of just seeing it very small on this little tiny screen. 
So in this case, we did that for both images on this page. Um, you can drag and drop images directly in on the Mac into that widget, or you can um, copy it in from the clipboard, which is what we did here. You can also insert PDFs directly into this, and then make the PDF maximizable when they touch it. So the next one is the popover widget. So here you'll see it before I start this, you've got this map and you see all these little camera icons. When a user taps one of these camera icons, um, in this case, it will pop up a picture of that location. So the way we can do that is we come up to the widget menu and we go down and select pop over here. And these are the widgets that are available to you in iBooks right now. And it will bring up this window where you can add a text or an image. So what we decided to do here was add these snapshots in. And here we are dragging one from off screen into this image down here, and we've made this camera icon now. So this makes it a little more intuitive that what the user is going to be looking at is an image. And then we take our camera and we can place it wherever on this base map. And then when we're ready to add information, we can then either type text or add an image. In this case, we're going to drag in an image of this area, which should come flying in from off screen here. Do you use TIFFs or JPEGs or EPS files? Any, or? Any, any image format you want. I'm not sure about EPS, but it can take GIF, JPEG, PDFs, all PNGs. that. Works. PNGs. Yeah, we generally use PNG files or PDF files for most of this. Um, so here we've got the picture, and we've got a title that we've typed in here, calling it the Scadlands. We can make the picture the full size of the pop-up and have the title at the bottom and the top. You could have additional text in here, too, about your information, and it would allow the user to scroll down with their fingertip. You can also change the background. We'll change it to some blurred colors here, but if you wanted a different backdrop color, you can change that as well. And the other thing that we're going to show you is, you'll see the, um, so this is the iPad demo here. And when they come in to tap on the center camera, you can see the cursor coming in, that glove is kind of the user's figure. They click this and it comes up. But what we're going to show you is around this image, see where it's moving, there's actually, we have a transparent image in here behind this. Because that camera is an awful small place to click on the screen. So if you have an iPad in front of you and you have a camera the size of like your pinky nail, that's difficult to get you know, a finger click on. So what we did was we dragged in a transparent image into that um, placeholder that you saw at the bottom. And that allows us to click in the full width of the transparent image that's around that camera. So even though you didn't see that initially, there is a buffer space around that camera image when we create the camera image. So what this one's showing is, this is on the iPad, you can also use this for inset maps. So, um, let me pause this for just a second. Oops. So, let's see, let me move back over to that. So the upshot to this, besides just showing little images like we've done here, you can also, um, if you have like an inset map that you want to show, so you've made this map, you have a really detailed area maybe where you have a lot going on, which this is going to show here in just a second. So like up top here, and you want your user to be able to zoom in or have kind of an inset map of that, you to put something else down in your page. You can take a closer image of that map or create a more um, up close version and drop that into this popover widget, which will let you create zoom, zoomed in or inset views pretty much on demand. And you can see we have like a little hand symbol up top there. Um, you need some way to indicate to your user what they're doing. If they just see this map with no icon or no indication that they can touch it, most people won't touch it or they'll just come onto this by accident and go, oh, I opened something. So one of the real challenges for us was figuring out how to um, show users what they can click on the screen and what they can't. And Brooke will go into that in a little more detail after these videos. So the next one is scrolling sidebar. So you can see we have text over here. And it looks like it ends at the bottom there, but it doesn't. The user can actually scroll down and read more about each of these images. So this lets you put a lot more text on your page than just the page limits will let you. So, and again, we go up to the widgets. In this case, we're selecting scrolling sidebar. And when you bring that up, it gives you a text box, which you can manipulate just like we did with the photo one. You can change the background. You can change text alignment. Here we've just pasted in some text. You can also type in whatever text it is that you might want to add. And you can see there's a lot of little alignment things that pop up here. iBooks makes it really easy and really intuitive to align all of your images and text together. So this is helping us get it centered up under this image. And once we have it in place, maybe we don't, you know, we don't like how this text looks, so we can change the alignment in here. 
And then now, when the user comes in and is mousing over this, they can scroll up and down through this text. So there's a few other things you can change. And for instance, here we're going to reduce the opacity so that you can see the background color of the page through the text instead of having a white box or a colored box behind it. And let's see. So then what I'm going to do is you can see that a sidebar now shows up when the mouse comes over. And it's the same on the iPad, which is what this is. When the user's figure comes over this, the scrolling sidebar will show up, and they can see that they can scroll up and down. The only problem with this that we encountered is that when you don't have a finger over this, you have no way of knowing that you can scroll up and down in this text. So some of this might look like it look like it ends there, but it doesn't. So another item that we need to look into adding is maybe an image of a sidebar or some arrows or something to indicate that they can scroll up and down in this text. So that's another challenge with this. So the next one I'm going to show you is the interactive image widget. So in this case, this is our Hanford Nuclear Reservation page. And all these pages are from that Columbia River Atlas. So this shows how that you can add in to show more information on pictures, basically, with these um, callouts. So it'll let you uh, put an image here in the center. You can see this picture. What we did was just drop that big Hanford map into that image. And then we're starting to move these callouts around. And you can use these menus here to add more callouts. You can do, it'll do a little auto greeting for you where it'll put in like um, gibberish basically as placeholders so that you can move it around and decide where you want your text to go before you have, you know, maybe you don't have your text written yet or you're not sure what you want to put in there. Um, you have placeholder text. And then you can replace that with whatever you like. And there's a lot of different options for this just like with all the other text boxes. You can change background colors. You can change how big it shows up on the screen. Um, you can also change the type of text that you're using, font, how it's arranged inside. So now we've got our text in place. And let's see. So it's going to move through this a little bit more. Yeah, so this is on the iPad now. And now when the user clicks on one of these or bounces over, it will open up and show them all this text that we put in. So you don't have a lot of text cluttering up your layout, but you can add a lot more information still to this image. And then they can make it full screen also. All of these. Um, interactive image widgets will have an icon in the upper left when the user comes over that will let them make it the entire size of their screen. So you can see all of the surrounding information has now gone and it makes it easier to see the background map and read the information that we've added. So the next one. So you can also add media to your maps. In this case, the media widget is what they call it, but it's really a video widget. You can drag quick time videos into it. So in this case, we have kind of a time-lapse video that we're going to drag in. So again, we'll go to the widgets menu and we come down to media, to the top right there. And you get what, something that looks like this. And you can adjust your options. In this case, we're going to get rid of the title and the caption here, but you could keep that if you wanted to have a title and caption for your video. And then we'll move it in place with all the helpful guidelines. And once we have that where we want it, and alter like we want it, we can drag in our QuickTime video, which we think should fly in from off screen here. Hopefully. Yeah, so here it comes. So you just drag and drop, which makes it really easy on the Mac. And you, now your video's in. It gives you a play button. You can also set what frame you want the user to see on this play area. So if you have like a title screen that you want to show, or a certain piece of your video that's maybe the most interesting, you can tell it which frame you want it to show behind that play button. So, and then you can also make it full screen. So we're going to show it on the iPad now. And they'll just come over here. And this has a play button, so that makes it really easy to see if they should tap it and it becomes a video or not. Um, you can control whether they can watch it more than once. You can control if it should go in a loop. And then they can watch it full screen and see all of the detail in your video on the full size of their tablet screen. So the next one. So this, Brooke was talking a little bit about SVG and HTML widgets. And we're not going to go into a lot of detail on that. Um, there is information on the Apple support webpage for making HTML widgets specifically for iBooks. It's a little bit complex. You need to have some command of programming or be interested in learning. Um, but what we did, we took the SVG opportunity with this, and we made a map that can give a little bit more information. So what we have here is um, this is a number of dams, and this SVG map is layered on top of this. And what it lets the user do is when they come in and they click, it will bring it to full screen, which takes a second in this case. And then this is the SVG map that we've put in this HTML widget. 
And when they come over and the dam will turn red when the user clicks it, it will show all this information that we have stored in the SVG language, which is the name of the dam, the year it was built, where it is, and its capacity. And this is information that might be hard, you know, there's a ton of dams on this map. You can't show all that information right up front to your user on the page. Putting this many widgets in place would be messy, so SVG is a way to get around that and add a lot more content. And that's using the HTML widget. And then the last thing is, you might have noticed, so whenever that widget menu got opened, there was like six things in there, you know, it doesn't look like there's much. There's a lot of other widgets out there that you can use on the magic of the internet. So if you come in and you want to use something more than what you have here, there are um, websites like Bookery, which I'm going to show you, and other ones that if you just look up, you can find tons of other stuff. So in this case, the widgets that you have available to you built in are things like the gallery, which is for photos, review, which is for quizzes, 3D, Brooke covered the keynote and other ones that we've just done. Then you can go online and all you have to do is search iBooks widgets and you will come up with lots of websites that have many, many free ones. Some of these websites like Bookery, if you pay them, they will also design widgets for you. So it just kind of depends on your budget and what you want. Um, so you can see you've got um, drag and drop, you can add calculators, Flickr galleries, Google Maps, YouTube. So you can bring in a lot more functionality than just what comes with the program when you download it. And if you're willing for a price, you can have them customize some things specifically to your needs that you want to add to your book. So that's some of what's available online. And I'm going to hand it back over to Brooke to talk a little bit about how we indicate in our activity. Yeah, so as uh, Jane mentioned earlier, if you don't indicate that something is interactive, users you typically don't um, go and just like touch things on the iPad to see if it's interactive. If you don't indicate it, they will probably just go right by and not even notice that you've done anything. And then they're losing out, out, out on a lot of the information that you've put into your page. So we learned that we have to find some way to show that we have interactive elements on our Atlas pages. So for the Atlas of the Columbia River Basin, one of the students in the class designed this um, symbol to indicate interactivity which is kind of a, a realistic hand, you know, tapping a, a black dot. And that was what we used to indicate interactivity. And then even just in the past year, a lot more interactivity has been integrated in some of these technologies. So the symbols that come along with it are starting to become standardized. So the image that we used is kind of hard to see here. You'll see it in a second. Um, for the Alice of Infectious Diseases, is a more standardized symbol that we're typically associating more and more with interactivity. So this is a map from the Columbia River Basin, and um, it's kind of difficult to see because of the light, but there are two places where we have that hand to indicate that something is interactive and that the user should go and tap it and something will happen. For the Alice of Infectious Diseases, we have two of those symbols here. Um, so again, that symbol that we used is, is more standard now than a year ago or two years ago. So we're able to use that. It kind of fits with the style of this atlas a little better than the one for the previous atlas does as well. Some of the limitations with the iBooks authoring software is the formatting. So there's a set size to what you use in your template. For atlases, generally there are a lot of information that goes along with, with each map, but you're only given a certain amount of space. So trying to format everything within um, your template can be challenging. Uh, some of the widgets can be difficult to use, especially if you're doing the SVG um, and the HTML that requires a little more special uh, skills. We noticed that zooming became a limitation. So as you saw, you can maximize an image to be the full size of the tablet. But if you want to zoom in even more, you know, typically what you would do on the iPad is use your two fingers to zoom in. But if you let go, the image will snap back to the original size. So if you want to zoom in and hold the image there, you actually have to hold your fingers on the tablet which we found to be kind of a limitation. Also, the maximum file size that you can upload to the iBook store is two gigabytes, which may be more than enough for a lot of people, but considering how graphics heavy our atlas is, that wasn't enough space. Um, uploading it to the iBook store would make it available if you went into um, iBooks and searched for it, you would find it. That's the benefit of having it uploaded to the iBook store. Some of user accessibility issues. Um, iBooks Author and iBooks is restricted to uh, Mac operating systems. It's not available to PC, it's not available to um, Android devices, uh, which limits a lot of what people can do with it, who can create things with it, and how people can access it. There's also variable device display size and resolution, especially with the introduction of retina displays in tablets that um, 
alters how we make the pages for our atlases. Uh, we also want to have searchable text. So one of the things that Jane mentioned was in the first atlas, we created each page as a PDF in whole so that not just the map was a PDF, but all the text along with it, all the figures were in one PDF, and that's what we took into iBooks Author. But we noticed when you do that and you put it into onto the iPad, you can't search the text because the text is part of a PDF image. So what we discovered and what we ended up doing with the second atlas is if you want to have searchable text, you actually have to put in the text with iBooks Author so that only your map is a PDF and that everything else you do in iBooks Author. You put in the text, you put in the images, and that allows the user on their um, tablet to actually search the text and find certain keywords. And then, as I mentioned, interactive feature detection is key. A lot of people don't know that there's interaction, interactivity on your page unless you indicate to them somehow that it is there. So although um, the group here has done a lot of work <coughs> with interactive atlases, and they've been really well received in the cartographic community, there still hasn't been a lot done with it. I don't think cartographers have fully taken advantage of the interactive and animated capabilities of ebooks. Um, and there's still a whole lot more to explore. What's great is that this has generated a lot of interest. So I think this is one of the directions that cartography is going to go in the future. And what we found that a lot of users really liked about the, the ebook atlases is that they have this book analogy. They have a beginning. They have an end. They have um, an, an interactive table of contents. And they also apply skeuomorphs, which is um, that animation that makes it look like the book cover is opening. Or when you turn a page, the page kind of rolls over. That's a skew discovered a lot of users really like that um, in the ebook atlases. So that's kind of all we had really to present to you today. Uh, we'd like to point you to the website for our group. It's cartography.oregonstate.edu. Um, and there's a lot of information on that on that site about the current research we're doing. If you go to the digital atlas systems, you can view the two atlases. So I'll just show you kind of how that looks. This is what the website looks like. If you, you can tap on either one of them, and it brings you to a place that has a description of the atlas, as well as instructions on how to download it. And you can download the iBooks file if you have a Mac um, or an iPad. You can access it that way. Uh, you can also download a static PDF if you have a PC. Um, but that, of course, won't have any of the interactive features. It really is just a PDF. So uh, you can explore both of, both of those atlases as well. Oh, and um, our group did publish a paper uh, in the Journal of Maps called Ebook Atlases for Tablet Computers, the Atlas of the Columbia River Basin, which, if you click on this link here, will take you to a place where you can download the paper, and we highly recommend that you take a look at it. Um, and do we have to uh, Oh, so we do have, um, I don't think, I don't know if OSU has access to this journal for free, but we do, we were provided a heavy number of links for free access to this by our publisher. So if you're interested in reading this in its entirety and you can't access the full article from this, you can feel free to contact Brooke or I. Our contact information is listed on the website. And let us know, and we can send you off a link to the full copy of the paper. Great. So we'd be happy to take any questions that anybody might have. Yeah.